Welcome to this special event we are hosting as Think Orbital uh, to celebrate the National Moon Day. Now, of course, it's not just a national celebration. The Apollo mission is very much an international celebration as we uh, look at the first humans to step on the moon back in July 20th, 1969. And uh, it's a very special occasion for the global space community. We wanted to host this event pretty much to uh, not just celebrate that occasion, but also uh, look at what the future advancements of space are going to be. Uh, we obviously are aware of the Artemis missions, the second uh, run of humanities back on the moon. And in between the Apollo era and the Artemis, we have had, of course, many other uh, successful stories from the space community. On the international collaboration, we've seen the International Space Station, which has been an amazing uh, development, a successful running mission for over 20 years, advancing a lot of science and uh, other capabilities for the space sector. Uh, we've seen very recently uh, the story from ISRO, the Indian Space and Research Organization on the Chandrayaan-3 mission. Uh, and very much as it is uh, of a national uh, development, it is also an international community effort where uh, anything that comes out of these research missions is very critical and very helpful for the overall space community and development. So uh, along with the public sector, we have seen private space grow as well. So SpaceX being a great example. Uh, of course, we've seen the uh, development on the Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy. We have Lee here, who's done a lot of work in that sector, and we'll touch on that in a bit. Uh, along with that, SpaceX has the Starlink program. A lot of this has developed the low Earth orbit economy. We've seen the development of the international, uh, the uh, in-space assembly and manufacturing sector, the ISAM. Uh, we've also seen developments on the counter space and military capabilities for space. And of course, the International Space Station does advance a lot of the scientific missions that we've been seeing for many, many years as well over the last 20 odd years that they've been developing those cycles. Uh, my name is Sushil Karam. I am the VP of strategy uh, and I think Orbital, and I'll also be the moderator for the event tonight. Well, tonight for me, uh, today for some of you as well. Uh, I have with myself Sebastian Esprella, who is our CEO and co-founder. And I have uh, Lee Rosen, who is our president, chief strategy officer, and co-founder at Think Orbital. Before I jump on to both of them to kind of discuss a little bit more about their background, uh, we have the comments section active. So any questions you have, this is very much a Q&A session. Uh, the intent is I would kind of run through a few questions for both our guests. Uh, we'll highlight a few key talking points and topics of what we're doing at Think Orbital. Uh, throughout the session, I'll, I will be checking the comment section. And at the end of it, we will be positioning those questions back to Sebastian and back to Lee. So uh, without further ado, uh, sh shall we probably start with Sebastian? Sebastian, if we could have a little bit about your background and how you come into the journey of starting Think Orbital. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be here today. Um, so yeah, I mean, for those that don't know me, um, I, uh, you know, I'm originally from Argentina, and I have a mixed background between electromechanics, um, psychology, and business. And business is what I've been doing over the last two decades, mostly in entrepreneurship roles, also helping out a few other startups as well. Um, so yeah, I've been about 25 years of leadership and entrepreneurship in business, IT, pharma, and also aerospace. Um, just a little bit of what my accomplishments are. Um, I had mainly leadership operational roles, but at the same time, I delivered um, just under 20 products, uh, which cover um, you know various different uh, business capability needs, but also regulatory needs across the EU as well. I stood up over 25 teams. I oversaw 500 million euros worth of expenditure. It's been a blast, right? And uh, But in the back of my mind, since childhood, I think like many of us, thinking about human space flight, how can we elevate ourselves into space? Um, and having supported a few other startups before, my goal was really to you know, gather all that experience, that knowledge, to be able to, to do something that we felt we, you know, we, could, we could make a difference. We could really add value. And that's basically the mission of Think Orbital, really to accelerate humanity's access to space through industrialization and commercialization. Um, since then, um, since we launched Think Orbital, we, uh, we grew to a number of uh, about seven FTEs at the moment, a group of amazing advisors and amazing investors. We raised a couple of million so far. We secured two um, US Space Force government contracts, which has recently been awarded quite a large, significant NASA contract, the CCSC2, um, which is great. Um, 
so and and my experience also included uh, you know managing multinational complex uh, product development which comes quite handy um, especially with the fact that although we're quite listening uh, in the US and the majority of the team will be in the US we do have an international partnership uh, when it comes to some of the development so yeah I mean that's that's been an actually I'm really happy to be here please put out any questions you have and as I said the weirdest and most esoteric ones would probably go to me and I'll pick up the easiest ones along the way so thank you I have to say Sebastian is always a, a very uh, good sign of a founder where uh, if you give him a question about the background, he will always jump into the company and talk a lot about what the company is already doing. So uh, we, we'll touch on some of those details in, in further uh, rounds as well as we I ask him more questions. But Lee, could we have the same for you, a bit of your background and the journey towards uh, Think Orbit or starting something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Karam, for hosting this. Seba, always. Good to spend time with you and everyone out there. Thanks so much for being a part of this today. Um, again, my name is Lee Rosen. I'm a co-founder and president of Think Orbital. Uh, my journey started uh, very young uh, as president of the high school model rocketry club. So space nerd since the very, very early days. Uh, had the good fortune of attending the United States Air Force Academy. Uh, and it's really there where my space uh, interest really kind of took off, so to speak. Uh, I served for 23 years uh, in the United States Air Force, really the space part of the United States Air Force before there was a Space Force. Uh, did various assignments, uh, multiple assignments at the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, several assignments at Los Angeles Air Force Base, now Space Force Base, uh, working on space acquisition, engineering, and operations. Uh, and had the opportunity to command at both of the U.S. launch bases. I was a squadron commander of the Force Space Launch Squadron at Vandenberg Air Force Base, where we helped to build the capability for the evolved expendable launch vehicle, Delta IV and Atlas V, and then uh, had the opportunity to command uh, at the 45th Launch Group at Cape Canaveral uh, Air Force Station at the time, um, where uh, we had the highest launch cadence uh, in very recent memory at 19 launches. So that seems like not many launches uh, at this point, but uh, uh, back then it was it was quite a few. And uh, back uh, in 2010, President Obama was coming down to the Cape Canaveral to announce the uh, commercial space initiative. They were gonna launch things to the International Space Station using uh, commercial entities. And everyone thought that was crazy, of course, uh, but uh, my big boss, General Bob Kaler, asked uh, me to tour the president around and um, we were contemplating where to take him. And uh, I gave him a few alternatives and the boss said, no, let's take him over to see those new guys at SpaceX. And uh, I'm like, mm, I'm not sure that's a great idea, sir. You know, it's uh, you know, the, the, something crazy could happen. Uh, killing the president would be career limiting for both of us. Just joking, of course. Uh, so, uh, you know, we ended up taking the president there and I had the opportunity, uh, while we're waiting for president Obama to show up to spend, uh, about two hours, uh, with Elon chatting about all things that seemed a little bit, uh, uh crazy at the time to be just completely frank, uh, you know, things like, you know, how would you land a rocket? What do you do with the rocket after you launch it? Um, do you think you could reuse a rocket? What are some of the things that you might do for landing a rocket, propulsive landing, aerostructures, parachutes, those kind of things. And I could see that Elon was thinking very differently from how the rest of the launch industry was going at the time. And I thought that might be an opportunity uh, to get more capability to our warfighters and strategic decision makers than perhaps I could achieve from the inside. So uh, I decided to retire from the Air Force uh, and had the good fortune to be able to go to SpaceX. Uh, I started out leading the build of the Vandenberg uh, launch site for both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Um, Elon asked me to come down to LA and run launch operations for a number of years, did that. We also had the integration of uh, all payloads for military, uh, uh, civil, and um, commercial missions on board uh, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. So the mission management of all of that, as well as getting to fly the Dragon spacecraft to the International Space Station, uh, which eventually culminated in launching 22 good friends uh, into uh, into orbit uh, through the commercial crew program, which was really uh, one of the highlights of my career. 
uh, and happy to talk more about that amazing experience. So spent 11 years uh, just about at SpaceX, uh, grateful for the opportunities, learned so much there. And um, after retiring from SpaceX, uh, took a little sabbatical, went over to uh, Scotland and uh, joined our daughter over there. Uh, never had an overseas assignment as a military guy and always wanted one. So we got to live in Scotland. Uh, and while there uh, was kind of cyber stalked by Sebastian, uh, he's really persuasive uh, and had the opportunity to uh, give us, give us, uh, uh, give this, uh, kind of give them a space perspective, right? We have uh, our co-founder Voida, who is kind of the big brain behind the operation. We have Sebastian with an amazing uh, uh, business and diplomatic background. Uh, and I think I add uh, a little bit of that space perspective uh, having been in the industry for over three decades now. So uh, that's kind of was my role uh, in becoming one of the co-founders of Think Orbital. And, um, you know, at SpaceX, we had this great chance to, to kind of change one of the biggest bottlenecks, which was getting mass to orbit and getting mass home, right? So uh, I think we had a tremendous impact on that. Now we have a relatively affordable, reliable, consistent launch. All of those things are now possible because of the great work of everyone at SpaceX. Um, we also have kind of ubiquitous communication around the world, thanks to the great work on Starlink and Starshield. Uh, so that 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 big bottleneck uh, is also so in contemplating Think Orbital, we kind of thought, well, what's the next big bottleneck that we have to overcome? And, um, you know, rocket the rockets that are being developed and have we have out there, of course, Falcon 9 being the workhorse that's out there, Starship, uh, which is going to change the paradigm on the cost curve as well as the mass and volume curves uh, are, are tremendous capabilities, uh, but they're still limited, right? You still have to basically build stuff on Earth today, cram it inside the payload accommodation of a rocket, and then launch it into outer space. Sometimes you can un-origami things and make them slightly bigger, but basically you're volume constrained. So um, you know, you wouldn't build the Empire State Building in New Jersey, put it on a truck and take it to New York City, right? Big things you have to build in situ. So we are learning the tool set that's required uh, to assemble things actually in situ, in space. Uh, and we'll talk more about that toolkit, uh, which will enable us to build that large infrastructure in space, up to four times the volume of the International Space Station on a single launch. So that will really change the game for scale and infrastructure in space. But less about uh, less about the company, less about me. Let's uh, let's get into some questions and start talking. Thanks so much. Thanks. I think before, just before we jump off, Lee is an absolute rock star. He has that combination of experience knowledge, getting the job done, you know, really digging deeper when you can and, and, and how successful he has been. And on top of that, his humility. So I'm very humbled to work with him, with you, Karam, uh, with, with, with everyone in the team at Think Orbital is that when you think about, you know, who would you like to, you know, make, make an positive impact in the world, I couldn't be prouder or happier to, to have the team that, that we have on site. And I'd love to, for one of the future sessions, we'll get a chance to also um, showcase some of these I'd say the top one percent, those great individuals that we have in the team. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah, and I, I think, uh, and when Lee was talking about the the trip with uh, President Obama and visiting SpaceX in those early years, uh, I, I remember I was telling you, Lee, a, a few months ago when I was traveling on flights, I was watching the one of the documentaries on Elon Musk, and uh, it was an image of you and kind of showing them around. And I was like, oh, I know that guy. So it's always amazing when you find those little gems on, on, on airplanes out of, out of nowhere. So it's, it's amazing and very humbling, like Sebastian said, to kind of work and collaborate together and uh, grow the team that we have so far. Uh, I think the next question, uh, probably uh, taking it more towards the broader theme of uh, what we're trying to build, uh, what the, what the uh, celebration is today in terms of the National Moon Day and the Apollo era. The, the, you know, Neil Armstrong sort of taking those first steps uh, on the moon and uh, very much, I think, uh, you know, being in school or kind of studying at any point in time, not just in the US, but even internationally, as Sebastian and I would have had, uh, the, the impact of that name, Neil Armstrong and the first man on the moon, for instance, uh, and the, the achievement that that mission actually means for not just the US, but globally for, for you know, humanity overall. Uh, what's your uh, 
and I'll probably I'll probably push this to Lee first and then take Sebastian's input. What's your kind of memory of first understanding of uh, you know okay this this was a huge achievement that humanity managed to pull off, and how does that impact you later as a trajectory in terms of picking you know space as a field of work or an area of work? No, that's a great question, Karam. Um, you know, my earliest memory, and I guess I'm that old, uh, is that moon landing. Um, I remember sitting uh, in my parents' living room uh, in near Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, watching the moon landing. Um, and, you know, just my parents being so excited and my brother and sister being just elated over what was happening. And at, at just a couple of years old, I, I didn't fully comprehend it, but um, it kind of became part of my psyche as I went forward. And, um, you know, but, you know, Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin and Mike Collins were, were, were all um, military people, frankly, uh, you know, test pilots and things like that. And that kind of inspired me uh, on my journey and led to me, you know, attending the Air Force Academy and serving in, in the military. So it was for me a very, very pivotal event personally. Um, and certainly that kind of opened up the universe to humankind. And I, you know, as we as we talk about the mission of Think Orbital and expanding humanity's reach uh, into the stars, I think it's really important that we celebrate major events uh, like the moon landing. Um, and, and there has been, of course, many, many others since that time. But that one was fundamental uh, in changing the way the world viewed humanity and what we can actually achieve. And I think it, it, it made us all feel like there is nothing that is impossible. The only law, uh, and this is one of Elon's tenets, uh, that you cannot violate is the laws of physics, right? And do we know all the laws of physics? No, not yet. So let's push everything to that very edge of physics and make things happen. And that's exactly what NASA did uh, in the 1960s and, and rising to President Kennedy's challenge, uh, which changed the world and changed the way we fundamentally think about humans in outer space. Great. Uh, Sebastian, if I could sort of push the same question to you, earliest memory of uh, the Apollo, uh, learning about the Apollo era and uh, you know, how yeah, that impacts think, you with your space journey. I, I think it was one of those uh, conspiracy videos saying that we've never landed on the moon. Don't even. <laughs> <laughs> but look, um, if, if there was any proof needed, I met Charlie Duke. He's, he's a real human being. He's been on the moon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I've been fascinated about um, about space generally perhaps st starting with slightly different angle about the mystery of space and and um and you know kind of that, that that cosmos and the possibilities up there since very early age but what caught my attention was really more the um, i would say the space shuttle program era you know being able to um as a conduit in fact it, and it kind of makes all sense now why we're working at think as a conduit to be able to um, elevate human presence first in low Earth orbit through the um, construction of the International Space Station and, and everything that, I, at least at the beginning, we thought would be, you know, the, the space shuttle, sort of higher reusability, lower cost, um, and, and all the dreams beyond that, like, you know, potential O'Neill cylinder and, and what have you. So, um, so for sure, and, and, you know, thinking about that, you know, you, you obviously you start going back um, into the, uh, the the moon program and then the Mercury program and everything that led kind of step by step to to where we are today. So um, I see it kind of as a as a kind of life process or time continuum um, on on how if we want to if we're able if we put the effort how we can how we can keep that process going forward to the point that um, you know and as technology advances in and I think much nearer future than, than most of us may have thought otherwise, we would be able to certainly commercialize the Earth orbit um, as, um, as Tom Weiss from um, Sierra says, you know, sort of that uh, low Earth orbit industrial revolution, the next industrial revolution, uh, orbital industrial revolution will, will take place much sooner than we think. And that's, yeah, that's, I think, is the energy and encouragement from our side. And also, um, I I believe strongly and, and and having met people who have gone to space and one of our advisors, Jim Weatherby, again, another amazing human being uh, uh, alongside everyone else in the team who has been to space, it gives you that perspective 
where you know you look back to earth and you realize that we are floating in this vast darkness and you cannot see any borders and you think that everything that ever happened to consciousness as we know it has happened uh within that small blue pale dot and i think that overview effect like frank uh, had coined uh, will help us go into the next gen next stage of, I think, human consciousness, you know, a, a point in time where we are all come together. And I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but I strongly believe in that. And I think the only way we can do that is if we elevate more and more people into space. So I'll kind of wrap it there and I'll send it back to you, Kanami. Yep. And uh, I think uh, you kind of touched a little bit also uh, when you were talking about some of the stuff you've heard from obviously other co-founders and uh, other leaders of uh, commercial space sector. Uh, one of the things I've, I've always liked about, uh, you know, the work we've done and from the very early stages, you know, when we've been speaking, Sebastian, is uh, the vision stayed very consistent on Think Orbital side. Uh, you know, I've, I've obviously we've seen the team kind of uh, grow and shrink at times and things have moved around. People have kind of moved here or there or to other companies as well, which has been great. Uh, at the same time, we've seen, I would say, the journey of, you know, 2021, where the markets really uh, you know, in amazing all hype space mode, everyone wants to invest in it. And then 2022, where it's like, uh, not sure what's going to happen. And, you know, the, the world's going to collapse. Uh, one thing that stayed consistent pretty much regardless of any feedback we were getting was, you know, the vision needs to be consistently built and move forward in that direction. You would probably have certain mild modifications, but I think that's not, that we've not seen a significant change. Uh, what do you what do you say have been some of the challenges in terms of sticking to the vision, sticking to that pathway, and also what have been some of the motivating factors along that way? Has have there been certain things that have really motivated and moved things forward, uh, you know, further and made it easier for you in that journey? Yeah, so I think the motivating factors is indeed a vision, so a future where we have helped humanity access space, commercialize space, um, also. Again, I keep mentioning the team, huge motivating factor, hanging out with people who are, you know, super smart, that you know, they're they're great to be around, um, that humble me and and um, and from whom I learn every day, I think that's a great motivating factor. Um and I think when you look at the mission, the mission is just too important not to put the effort, right? And and um and from that perspective, and also many don't know this, I mean I've I've only recently this week. Um, exclusively working for the Corbital. So um, some of the challenges was just to keep keep that mind uh, focused, um, you know, keep, keep that mission in mind. We're very much objective driven. Um, so for those that do not know, um, you know, we only work for an objective that has been agreed and has set. We do have priorities on objectives. That's something that I felt historically has worked, especially when you have teams working remotely. Um, so yeah, and, and like you mentioned, you know, sort of the market conditions in a way um, kind of make it out, you know, we'll, we'll be able to, you know, to make it, we'll be able to deliver. And, uh, and, and so far we're tracking, um, you know, so far we are very much on target within, you know, sort of a little bit of an aggressive timeline that we put across. I do generally believe, but not just within COVID, but in my life that I'm behind where I would like to be, um, uh, compared to where I am. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you look at, for example, um, you know, about team, uh, formation, um, you know, we're, we're tracking well. We've got a great team. We have someone else joining us on the 21st of August, who's also an absolute rock star. Um, we will we, we do announcement later on. When you look at the technology, we're de-risking the technology well, uh, and I think we'll talk a little bit later on. But we have, you know, we have a flight scheduled towards the end of this year, and another one meet next year, which will showcase uh, quite a few important things for us and for humanity as well. When it comes to funding, I mean, wow, you know, if you know, if we manage to raise a couple of million in these current climate conditions, uh, market conditions, um, you know, we've learned so much. Um, and um, just to come, uh, one other investor was saying, if, if you learn how to raise in, in these type of situations, then that means, you know, you, you've learned much everything. And uh, and once the market settles, which will it will, it, it may not be this year or next year, maybe 25, then you're you're really set uh, when it comes to when it comes to fundraising. And um, and ultimately, to me, it's about you know execution and and pace and um and again we're super, super happy in that sense as well so i think in a nutshell um my my excitement takes to take over and and the way i see life generally um is about solving problems and challenges 
and I do get excited about it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, I'll stop here. <laughs> I'll, back to you, Karen. All right. Uh, and I think uh, you, you did mention earlier a little bit uh, when we were doing the introduction, Sebastian, about the, uh, uh, I think, I think you, I, if I'm not mistaken, you said CCSC too. Uh, and I know Lee, Lee must have been like, oh, you know, can't use an acronym. Give, give, us, give us the full form. I actually had to write it down just so I make sure I remember Collaboration for Commercial Space Capabilities, the NASA contract, which is the Space Act Agreement. Uh, yeah. And uh, obviously that's been a huge push as well, I think, for the team and kind of a boost. And, uh, you know, when, when these little milestones come through, uh, the team kind of really feels we, we make a big shift and grow further. Uh, I know we also have the, uh, the uh, NASA source selection statement, which is now public. So that's another, you know, kind of uh, effort that really showcases where the feedback is, what, what further work needs to be done. But Lee, uh, you uh, were involved with the original uh, CCSC rather than CCSC2, which is a uh, collaboration of commercial space capabilities with uh, SpaceX back in 2014. And SpaceX was one of the younger companies back then that kind of won that uh, agreement from NASA, along with, I think there was ULA, there was a North Grumman company as well. Uh, I'm quite curious to kind of uh, two questions. One, uh, what was the real impact of that for SpaceX at that stage back in 2014? Uh, and how, how important was something like that in terms of developing SpaceX further? Uh, the second question, similarly applying that to Think Orbital today, where do you think it applies and how do you think it advances? What are the kind of key steps from here uh, for Think Orbital? Of course, whatever that can be shared publicly at this stage uh, to announce further. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the collaborations for commercial space capabilities uh, was was you know foundational uh, to the recognition that that SpaceX was truly becoming an industry player, uh, and to have been awarded that alongside uh, giants in the industry like like Northrop Grumman and United Launch Alliance, which is uh, for those who aren't familiar, a conglomeration of Boeing and Lockheed Martin. I, I think you know that added additional credibility during SpaceX's journey to do things like get uh, certified to fly uh, military missions, NASA missions, uh, human missions, all of those kind of things. So I think that association with NASA uh, and strengthening the bonds that were kind of already started with NASA um, and, and Gwen and Elon have both said publicly that uh, without NASA, there would be no SpaceX. Uh, and uh, I couldn't agree more. And the, that first uh, collaborations uh, Space Act agreement really was foundational in trying to to help SpaceX get aligned with uh, with NASA and to build new capability. And um, you know, things like Starship uh, may not be uh, may not have been possible today without NASA's continued help, collaboration, and things like that. So I think. Th that had a tremendous impact on SpaceX and SpaceX's trajectory, frankly. Um, and I believe that it will have a very similar impact on Think Orbital um, to be awarded the second iteration of this uh, contract with the likes of SpaceX and Northrop Grumman and Sierra and the other uh, companies uh, that are that are all major outstanding have been around for a while um, is is a validation for us that we've got a, a great thing a great concept uh, technology that is uh, going to fundamentally change the way we build things in outer space and you know the focus of this second uh, NASA agreement uh, was really on stimulating uh, the new space economy in low Earth orbit. And that's exactly what Think Orbital uh, and the platforms and the large scale infrastructure that we're building has the opportunity to do. Um, and this Space Act Agreement gives us access to the tremendous resources that NASA has, everything from expertise. Uh, we've been talking, for example, with Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, about uh, their modeling of electron beam welding. Uh, so we've got access to the experts down there. Uh, we're working with them on uh, our upcoming mission, uh, as well as the European Space Agency. So that credibility, that access to NASA people, resources, testing equipment, facilities, all of those kind of things that we can request through NASA now officially um, as part of this agreement uh, really will help us and bring tremendous value, uh, not only on the monetary side, but also 
the intangibles of the credit associated hopefully like it did with SpaceX will lead to closer collaborations and contracts uh, directly with NASA to build capability. Great. And uh, yeah, I think you spoke a little bit about the uh, missions that we're working on slightly. And uh, I think Sebastian, uh, if I could probably ask you a little more to elaborate on the overall electron uh, beam toolkit and uh, the uh, in-space construction technology that we're really working on. Uh, how do you see these uh, these technologies kind of really advance the next phase of um, what we call the next giant leap for mankind as such, you know, in terms of not just uh, lunar, you know, Mars, but also looking at things like space debris uh, or any other missions that come along along the way for low Earth, uh, low Earth orbit as well? Yeah, so before I jump there, the people are commenting, um, and thanks for all the comments. Um, I think Karam will get back to them after we, we've done the first few questions, right? That's right. So uh, we have the comments right here. We will definitely be pulling them in and uh, I'll be positioning those questions back at Lee and Sebastian. So please yeah. uh, keep the okay, comments. Okay. No, there's a few good questions coming through. I'd love to have some time to answer them. And I appreciate everyone who's taking the time to, to log in today. So, yeah, I mean, when it comes to, you know, the ultimate goal, you know, to be able to um, accelerate humanity's access to space through the industrialization of low Earth orbit and beyond, we believe very much we need to start from the uh, ground up. I mean, that's kind of, you know, the way I, I learned also to develop product before, you know, try to target minimum viable product, build your technology stack to the point where, you know, you can achieve your grander vision, your grander vision and your mission as well. Um, so the first stage in that uh, technology stack for us is what we call the construction toolkit or the toolkit. Um, and that has a number of applications, primarily is to be able to weld, to cut, also to be able to inspect and to, um, you know, repair or edit manufacturing in space. Um, we like to coin them on Think World, Think Impact and Think Print. Um, but ultimately what this technology combined do is to give you the ability to be able to construct uh, assets in space, construct infrastructure in space. And the underlying technology that we're utilizing for all of this is Electron Beam. Uh, we're partnered with probably the foremost welding institute um, uh, when it comes to electron beam, for sure, that's the Weld Institute based in Cambridge, not far from London, about an hour and a half from London. Um, great people to, to collaborate with. Um, and where we're at in that stage is that we're, we've already have a prototype doing burn runs inside the thermal vacuum chamber. For those that do not know, electron beam technology requires to operate in vacuum, uh, which makes it a little bit cumbersome here on Earth. I mean, there's quite a few applications, but of course, you know, as you start going up, uh, we have the perfect vacuum up in space, so that's why that technology lends itself well uh, to be able to operate in space. And although it has been operated back in the day by cosmonauts, that was a handheld gun, very low powered, what we're looking at is actually is robotically operated. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the well part of it, uh, we're again tracking well. Um, we should be able to have a prototype ready towards Q4 this year which would then lend itself to our scheduled flight, which I can talk a little bit more. If people are interested, please do ask me that question. Um, and now, once you sorted out welding, um, not far from that, you have the possibility of being able to cut. And it's effectively the, the cutting, it's you basically, um, you know, spread the, the alloys, the materials as I like to see it, basically separate into alloys in space, which also comes quite handy, you know, if you want to be able to package an existing asset in space um, or, or you know, potentially for the orbiting as well. And the inspection piece is also comes quite handy. Um, you know, we, we believe in a future where we can leverage robotics and autonomy in space. Um, you know, humans were not built, especially for extravehicular activities and, and particularly so for, you know, for the way we'd like to operate in space, which is sort of low, low cost, high cadence. Uh, it makes sense for a robotic um, uh, manipulation of our electron beam technology, including welding, cutting, and then to be able to inspect that remotely. Uh, and that's sort of the, the third piece in, in the puzzle. And then ultimately to be able to do also added manufacturing. So if we have a structure like you, you've seen just now on the screen and you know, it, get hit, it gets hit by, uh, by debris or micrometeorite to be able to go out and, and do some of the repairs as, as well as being able to build some trusses, build some parts, build some infrastructure, which you may not want to wait until the next mission you may want to be able to print it out in situ, maybe even utilizing in situ resources uh, to be able to complete your mission. Um, so I think that's kind of our first stage. 
build that construction toolkit, uh, make sure that we de-risk that part of the technology. And that in itself, we have quite a lot of interest, uh, not let alone, uh, you know, as part of the, uh, the, the CCSC2, um, you know, agreement with NASA, but also in discussions with other partners as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell. Back to you, Karim. Great, thanks. And I, I think, uh... Obviously, we have seen a few uh, comments come up, and I'll move on to the comments just shortly. I have one last question uh, for Lee from my side, which I think might be an interesting one. Uh, Lee, you've obviously served with uh, the US Air Force for over 20 years. Uh, you've been a space operator and engineer with them. Uh, from uh, SpaceX side, you've obviously also worked on the uh, US Space Force certification for uh, the Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy. How do you see, uh, you know, from, from that unique perspective of the military and space domain, how do you see Think Orbital contributing to the Space Force mission, uh, specifically of uh, conducting global space operations that enhance the way our joint and coalition forces uh, fight together? Thanks very much, Karam. Yeah, it was an honor to serve, of course, and uh, being in the space part of the Air Force for my entire career, I think um, I can confidently say that you know, what Think Orbital is bringing to the table adds to the mission of the space force, right? Which is basically to, to prevent or to uh, enable freedom of operations in outer space. So I think that that's, um, you know, what, what we're doing is key to one of the main factors that the space force is uh, considering right now, and that's resiliency in outer space. And how do you become more resilient in outer space? Well, um, you can take care of your assets better. You can provide more options for commanders uh, in space. You can know what's going on inside the space domain. And I think many of the capabilities that we're bringing to the table as part of Think Orbital really are well aligned with the mission sets that the Space Force is doing. And one in particular that I'm really excited about um, having worked uh, in the counter space uh, area in the area of space domain awareness uh, as part of our inspection capability, I think is really, really powerful. Um, as part of packaging this toolkit that we're building uh, that we'll eventually need and use ourselves to build this large infrastructure in space, uh, we will be able to package the welding, cutting, inspection, and printing piece. But the inspection piece that will have a visual uh, and IR uh, or thermal infrared camera on board will uh, enable us to uh, build a package relatively small, easily integratable, and um, very useful for the space domain awareness mission. Because if I will be able to sell these uh, toolkits to the multitude of space tugs that are uh, coming on board, the space servicing missions, the refueling missions like OrbitFab, um, other missions like Argo Space, who are doing, uh, you know, asset repositioning and uh, logistics delivery, Transastra, uh, who are helping remove de debris, much like uh, Cal Morris. Uh, so there are a multitude of these missions, um, and basically we can help them go from an opportunity to to do that one thing that they do well and turn them into kind of a, a Leatherman multi-tool. Um, so that they can do many things and become a distributed nodal network for space domain awareness, because now they have these inspection capabilities, not just visual, not just infrared thermal, but also uh, X-ray inspection and the ability to actually see inside of a satellite. The potential for that is super exciting, uh, not only to diagnose problems, but to basically understand and characterize new assets that are in space as well. So very exciting. Uh, possibility. Uh, and we're very excited to be talking to the U.S. Space Force about many of these capabilities. That's great. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll kind of move on to the questions. And uh, on the platform here, I can see uh, some of the LinkedIn questions. Some I have to jump directly onto my phone and see it off LinkedIn. So I'm going to kind of switch between the two. Uh, the ones that I can show on the screen here, I kind of will. So uh, we have one uh, which I think, Sebastian, you briefly touched on this, might be a good uh, area to touch a little bit more on. Do obsolete satellite debris uh, in orbit play a role uh, as a feedstock in our construction methodology, uh, particularly if we're looking at as fuel or anything else that we need uh, uh, to, to actually manufacture and build something further with the electron beam welder? So I would say that that is the ideal scenario. Um, 
of course, there's a lot of engineering challenges in between. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that we would envision would be to be able to, um, let's say, let's say inbound an asset. And of course, there is a lot of details there. So I'm kind of touching just, just the surface. But inbound an asset um, that has been decommissioned and, um, and in a way deal with the asset as you know le le one less piece of debris um, that could jeopardize other missions um, and at the same time reutilize some of the uh, materials in which that asset has been put together so you know there's some alloys that lend themselves well to be smelted and some of them to become uh, you know fuel rods you know for propellant for other assets so imagine a future where and this is something that we kind of thought about since the beginning. And, you know, uh, Lee coined some of the uh, startups that we do admire a lot, like KMI, uh, Orbit Fab. I mean, the list goes on and on, Spaceforge and and, and many, many others. Um, so, but build that ecosystem in space, elevate, yeah, uh, sort of rising tide, elev elevate everybody to build that ecosystem in space, where imagine that you would have a tug picking up, um, a, you know, the commission asset brought into sort of the way station, um, so I think the thing platform, and then within the thing platform, you could disassemble that asset, um, some of the materials to be reutilized for fuel rods, um, but also for wire feed, for building other trusses or maybe repairs, as I mentioned earlier, and they start building a little bit that circular economy, right? Um, so that, yeah, that in a way would be, um, that would be ideal. Um, and now the question when it comes to debris management is, you know, who, who's going to pay for it? Uh, to some extent, if um, you know, if the, um, the the economy doesn't uh, sort of the the numbers do not necessarily add up, and we we're in a situation where maybe a little bit the tragedy of the commons. Uh, but I'm you know generally quite a positive a big guy, so I'm sure we're going to be able to deal with that um, with that concern with that issue um, as uh, you know governments start to come a little bit together and uh, and we start revising how. How do we manage that um, going forward? So, thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. I see another question on LinkedIn about uh, uh, someone commenting on they see and they, they see the image in the backdrop that all three of us have of the Think Platform Two. A uh, little bit about uh, what what exactly is it, and when can we see something like that in orbit timeline wise? Uh, Lee, Sebastian, who would like to take that? Oh, I'm talking. Go ahead, Sebastian. Yeah. Uh, should I pick one of you? Yeah, I'll, I'll, you can pick next time you can pick. So uh, um, I understand the question is to do with the Think Platform, right? That's right, Think Platform 2, so the one in the backdrop. Oh, the Think Platform 2, okay, that's correct. So, I mean, regarding our estimations and provided we keep tracking against them, uh, we're looking at, um, you know, having at least uh, smaller version of the Think Platform 2 um, in probably around 48 uh, to 60 months in space. Okay. Uh, Lee, did, did you, I, I see you moved a bit. Do you want to say something? Oh, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, obviously, you know, there's an evolutionary path here, building toolkit, getting that uh, in the next two to three years, uh, and then being able to do this assembly, um, you know, on that NASA collaborations uh, space act agreement that we have, uh, we have a timeline that's very well laid out and working with NASA uh, to be able to bring that to fruition. So I think that, uh, you know, those timelines, um, you know, the, the more people we add, the more resources we add, I I don't want to in the next couple of years, so we're oh, excited about that. Okay, I, I see a com co comment from Connor saying, "Is that Elon time?" It it may be, huh. maybe. <laughs> uh, but no, I, you, I, I disagree, right? Uh, it, it's no, not. No, no, I'm just kidding. Be, yeah. you, I, I think listen. it's. Um, I just to basically yeah support what you were saying, Lee. Um, it, you know, it's about keep keeping that pace. Um, you know, keep keeping the, the right level of resources. To be able to accelerate through our technology, our product market feed, and customer journey, um, I think those timelines are achievable. Yes. Great. I see another question on LinkedIn about uh, apart from the United States, uh, are there any other countries that think Orbital plans to collaborate with 
in building this technology. Uh, should we go with Lee on that one? Yeah, we are already collaborating uh, with uh, an international partner, and that's the Welding Institute in Cambridge, England. Uh, they've been uh, terrific and super helpful uh, in advancing our technology, basically taking a, a, a weld head that for most terrestrial applications is about the size of a microwave oven uh, and shrinking it down uh, to uh, about the size of a Coke can or so. So uh, that that big piece of uh, the design work uh, in collaboration with the Welding Institute and the test mentioned now doing um, melt runs, cutting and welding in vacuum today uh, is thanks to our friends at uh, the Welding Institute. And the applications that we have, um, we've seen some comments uh, on the, the chat here about power. Uh, it, it's much lower power than you might think because we're not cutting through like six inch steel for a nuclear reactor here. It's, um, it's much less uh, of the power, uh, you know, depending on the, the thickness of the material that we're going, it's in the two to five kilowatt range. Um, and we weld very, very quickly. Uh, so we use that power very, very efficiently, almost uh, a meter uh, a minute. So it, it is a very, very quick process. Uh, and we have battery backup and storage uh, to be able to harvest that power, uh, trickle charge, recharge, and then get back onto that welding. So it's something that um, you know, we have thought about uh, in our both our power supplies and uh, what the power requirements will be for large stations like the one that you see in the background behind us. Having trouble hearing you, Karam. Sorry about that. Can I should be clear now? Uh, yep. I think we have gone through most of the comments. I'm just going through if there's anything else that sticks out. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We're kind of around at the moment. So if anyone else has more comments, please do keep them coming. Otherwise, I can have one final question from my end. Uh, uh, and I'll probably put this on to Sebastian. Sebastian, in terms of partnerships, uh, and I've obviously, uh, we've spoken about this offline quite a bit in terms of always going after, you know, any potential supplier or contact that we're looking at, we try to build them into more of a partnership model. Uh, what specific areas do you think we need to further keep evolving our partnerships uh, to accelerate the growth of uh, our welding capabilities and our overall toolkit development? Yeah, um, I'll answer that question, but I've seen other comments. I think it was a great question from Derek, Derek Guyton, um, but I can answer that question after your question. So, yeah, so since the outset, um, you know, I personally don't believe in competition, especially not at the stage we are now. Um, it's a serious sum game. So where we came in was sort of in that niche where we felt we could add value, right? We've not we've not seen anybody tackling this problem, not to, not to the magnitude that we are trying to do with the uh, with the methods that we are trying to do with the technology that we are developing. Um, so then the question was, you know, how how can we fit in uh, into a future, um, you know, especially low Earth orbit economy, the lunar economy, is lunar and beyond, and who are the players that actually we could combine forces with, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to the, the full life cycle, like from, you know, manufacturing here on earth, well, the, the, the research and design, the design and development, we mentioned the TWI, but also, you know, how do we go forward? How do we launch? You know, how, how do we actually do the um, testing space, the assembly process? So um, in a way we look at it from a matrix perspective, so the full technology stack, of all the subsystems or the technologies that we need in order to have the toolkit ready, but all the way to the same platform, but also how do we make that operational? And then ultimately, how do we help create that economy? You know, and what are the markets? Who are the customers that we could be satisfying? Um, so I think I think with, with that in mind, it's not, no, it's not a 2D, but it's a 3D perspective. Um, and we have the sort of multi-pronged approach. So understand um, you know, understand the market, understand the customers. We had uh, over, um, you know, 50 customer discovery calls so far, um, understand their needs, their pain points, both government, uh, defense and civilian, but also uh, private customers. Uh, understand, you know, what do we need to do in terms of amending and, and, uh, and evolving our technology roadmap and what should we be focusing more or first to be able to address those needs. Ultimately, you know, we're a profit making Company. We're not a research company, so we want to be profitable. We want to be successful. And then 
um, you know, looking at the technology and the products, ultimately the products that we need to deliver and how can we make sure that we can deliver those products to the minimum level of specifications that are required with, you know, with enough resilience built into them uh, and, uh, and from a perspective of cost, right? Um, that it makes sense that we could eventually become profitable. Um, so with that in mind, maybe long, long answer um, to a short question, uh, you know, we're looking partners, for example, you know, with the flight that we have coming up now, just to give a simple example, the battery suppliers, you know, the, the data tools suppliers, the, um, you know, the, the, the people who would actually support us when it comes to the, uh, to the actual motor to be able to perform what we need to do in, in our flight one. So all of these people will bring them along. Um, and, you know, with, with, you know, with that in mind, you know, building that relationship early on, which to me has been always very uh, successful in the past, build that relationship with the right partners, uh, uh, help them grow as you grow um, and be, be part of the journey overall. Back to you, Karim. Thanks, Sebastian. And I think uh, one of the questions from Derek that I might pass on to Lee, and then I have a nice one for Lee on uh, potential uh, concert uh, venue as well. So uh, first one for Lee is, uh, what, what advancements uh, have been made uh, in the in space welding and metal 3D printing uh, beyond what the Russians have made long ago, done long ago, basically? Wow. Uh, so there have been tremendous advancements uh, over the years. Uh, and actually, the, the first instantiation of in space welding that we've read about was back on Skylab uh, in the 70s. And it really wasn't welding, it was more melting metals. Uh, and then, of course, the Soviets using it in the 80s. Uh, with a handheld uh, gun uh, and an astronaut. Uh, you have to keep very tight tolerances to do welding with uh, electron beam as you don't actually have a filler material with you. You're actually uh, taking the two pieces of parent material, butting them up uh, against each other, and then the electron beam uh, basically joins those two pieces of metal together. So uh, those, those advancements and understanding of how the fundamental physics works in outer space uh, were very helpful from those uh, initial attempts at in-space welding, but the field of electron beam has really, really grown, and it's used in, in so many applications. Of course, uh, it's used at SpaceX for, for a few different applications, um, and it's used terrestrially. Um, the other interesting thing about the electron beam uh, and the toolkit, of course, is that it it does allow us to do more than just weld, right? We talked about the cutting capability and basically what you're doing is, as Sebastian uh, articulately mentioned is basically sculpting metal away from the center line um, and allowing uh, the, the forces uh, to basically let that metal cool uh, in a different place than the original uh, place that it was where the electron beam hit it. And you do that by electronically steering that electron beam. So we've made some advances uh, in that, along with uh, the Welding Institute, uh, and the the shrinking down of our weld head, I think, is another big advancement. Right, taking something that's large, used for terrestrial applications where size doesn't matter so much, uh, and getting it down into that small package is another big advancement that that we've had in the electron beam side. Uh, the other piece, of course, is additive manufacturing, uh, and the Welding Institute uh, is a pioneer in this field as well, and they have. Uh, managed to print some very large objects uh, using electron beam and we're planning on doing that uh, with our weld head too. Uh, the x-ray inspection uh, doing both backscatter and uh, uh, backside detector of the, uh, the x-rays that are generated when you defocus that uh, electron beam uh, is another uh, field of technology that has had some great advancements thanks to the work that's done at the Welding Institute in Cambridge. So lots of lots of uh, exciting things going on in the field of electron beam welding, um, and we're 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 right in the middle of it. And it's it uh, I can't tell you how how awesome it is. Yeah. And if I just yeah. make quickly compliment um, what Lee was saying. So I mean, and from my experience, also coming from a technology background, and, and you know, um, I I love understanding innovation and how innovation happens and you know, there, there is a difference between ideas and execution, but it's also the difference between ideas, execution and timing. And where I think we are now, we're at the cusp of, you know, um, general artificial intelligence. You know, many of us know more laws about, you know, sort of doubling of performance power. So 
all of this is actually coming together nicely at the moment. So that allows us also to be able to have a combination of the right technologies, we're not bending physics, that would allow us to do that construction in space. It's not just in, in the past people didn't want to do it. It's just that right now, um, you know, we're, we're at a time in, in technology and space um, that, you know, that can, that can be achieved. Yeah, I, I, if I could add just really quickly, the precision robotics piece is another thing that uh, advancements have really uh, helped uh, solidify what we are going to be able to do uh, in the field of, of outer space, uh, you know, robotics welding and, and assembly, right? I mean, we do surgeries on humans robotically. Um, our CTO, Frank Tybor and I had the opportunity to go to uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California yesterday um, and see some of their advanced robotics that they have doing antenna assembly in space. And they're doing it now with uh, with segments of uh, kind of a, a, a traditional uh, material, a, a, a kind of a plasticized material for uh, assembly of that antenna. And uh, there are gaps in between. And we talked about, you know, hey, if we could you know, use our technology to assemble a large array, a large antenna in space uh, where you can weld those seams and have a higher gain from that antenna, uh, we could change that field as well. So there's there are so many enabling technologies that the timing is, is just right, uh, whether it's the robotics and the precision of the robotics, whether it's the welding, whether it's the advancements in x-ray technology and those kind of things, I, I think all of that um, you know, makes the time today the right time to make all of this happen. Great. And I, I think we're close to uh, wrapping up on a couple of more minutes, but uh, I'll run through a few quick questions. I'll leave this one specific to you. If you could uh, build a concert venue in space, who do you pick? And keep in mind, Sebastian and I have, have our own taste in music as well. <laughs> That's a that's an awesome question. And you know what? I would love to have a thing platform be a concert venue someday. Uh, and of course, I would have the greatest rock band in history play at that venue. Uh, of course, you too. Uh, I got to see them live at Red Rocks back in the day and uh, having them play uh, their first show in outer space, I think would be amazing. Sebastian, you okay with you too? Or does that not work? Oh, yeah. I, I yeah. Actually, I, I would love to have um, like not that similar to Blue Moon, just to have a, a popery of different artists coming up. Uh, but I know we we kind of on time, and um, uh, you know I, I really appreciate everyone who's jumped in the call. I appreciate everyone who's been part of the journey. We've not we've not been able to be here if it wasn't for you. And again, I, I probably run out of time on thanking people individually, and also all the other uh, companies who we are collaborating as well. So we we'll make sure that you know we we'll try and. Uh, bring them in the fold uh, for next calls, perhaps, or next interactions. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the community that we have on, on LinkedIn, I'm per, very much appreciative. And do provide us with any more questions you have, any comments, any feedback specifically, if you found uh, this uh, interesting and fair, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it back to Karam in terms of what, what we may have in terms of future events. Great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I know we still have some comments coming in and, uh, you know, definitely if you, if you have any questions, uh, Lee and Sebastian are pretty active on, uh, uh, LinkedIn. So do reach out, drop them a note and, uh, you know, or, or to me or anyone on our team for that matter, uh, the team's pretty happy to always keep talking and chatting about what we're doing at Think Orbital. Uh, so reach out anytime, uh, you know, any questions you have, uh, to connect or discuss, we're always around. Uh, and uh, thank you so much to everyone who's attended. Uh, I'll have uh, probably Lee give a quick closing remark as well, and then we'll wrap up the session. Oh, thanks very much, Kram. It's uh, It's been an honor to, to be with everyone today. Great question, super awesome technical, uh, as well as some ones that made me stretch my brain uh, and excited about all the possibilities here. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks to our partners. Thanks to, to NASA, the US Space Force for believing in us and we are going to make this happen. Um, and we have just a sense of urgency and we know that the time is right uh, for Think Orbital and we know that uh, you will see that as well soon. Thanks very much.